coming up. In the United States, uh, the Intelligence Committee, that the uh, nuclear weapons could be launched in space by placing the weapon into orbit. Is that possible right now? Do we know that it's not uh, currently in place? Currently, uh, the Americans, uh, they have built a network of hundreds of spy satellites, but through Elon Musk's company. Um, I, I know that I have a lot of questions about that partnership, considering our allyship and, and our extreme uh, intertwined uh, role with the United States. How reliant are we upon uh, a company like SpaceX, for example, um, uh, for our capabilities? In 2022, the Auditor General reported that uh, that it will take a decade for the Canadian Space Agency to launch a successor to RadarSat, uh, and that an interruption in satellite Earth observation services past 2026 is a significant risk. Um, when will we have a successor to RadarSat? The nuclear weaponization of space. Uh, the U.S., I know back in the 60s, did a number of nuclear tests, I think five, under Operation Fishbowl. Um, knowing the impact back then, uh, if the Russians decided to target satellites, how big a blast area are we potentially talking about and how many communication satellites and other satellites that we have in space would be impacted at the various levels? There is the politics of industry itself. Uh, I'll raise the Starlink issue with, um, with the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict that was played out in, in a very public way. Um, and so s some in the public might say that an increasing reliance on the private sector or industry or for-profit organizations, there, there may arise in the future, and I'll, I'll, I'm not asking for your opinion on the Starlink situation, but there may be scenarios like that in the future where there's some question about security and partnerships, whether they're legal or not. Um, how can the public be assured that we're, we're protected with those agreements, knowing that there's an element of politics um, with some of these situations that arise? This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. This February, the U.S. House Intelligence Committee Chairman, Re Republican, uh, Mike Turner disclosed a new threat by Russia to deploy a new anti-satellite weapon. How imminent is this new threat? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, thanks very much. It's a great question and certainly uh, an issue that concerns us uh, significantly. We are working with the American uh, Space Force and Space Command in order to uh, understand what that threat might be uh, and understand what um, implications that might pose uh, to activities in the domain. Uh, we don't believe at the moment that there is any imminent threat, but certainly as we uh, look uh, with the Americans and our allies uh, to understand what might be going on, uh, that's certainly something that in due course would be communicated uh, to those that would be implicated. Okay, so it was indicated that the new weapon developed by Russia may utilize nuclear weapons to destroy satellites. Uh, how credible is it at this point that that is feasible to do in the near future? I think as a feasibility, certainly it is a possibility, but I don't think that we're able to conclusively determine at this point that that is, in fact, what the nature of the weapon might be. If Russia were to use uh, nuclear uh, bombs in space, what are the consequences if they were to detonate a nuclear device in low Earth orbit? Could you... Uh, certainly a, a great question and, and one that we're trying to understand ourselves. We've seen in the past, uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, there were tests that were done with these kinds of uh, weapons in space, uh, which provided, I think, a bit of a benchmark uh, in case something like that was to occur again. Um, it's probably worth stating as well that international law prohibits the placement of nuclear weapons in space. So this would be a direct violation of that and certainly counter to accepted norms of behavior that we would expect from any spacefaring nation. Uh, the impact and implications of something like that, I think, would be considerable in terms of what it might do to pollute the environment, how it might directly affect uh, satellites that were sort of in the near vicinity of such a blast, uh, and certainly it would be, um, you know, cause for concern that we might in fact lose some of the utility of some of those satellites if they're not appropriately hardened. And impact on Earth? It really depends on the, the altitude at which something like that would happen, but I don't think that we would expect there would be a direct impact on Earth. Okay, okay. so according to a leaked U.S. intelligence report, China is building a sophisticated cyber weapon or more than one to seize control of enemy satellites, rendering them useless for data signals or surveillance during wartime. How prepared is Canada 
to deal with this and what is the financial allocation uh, out of this budget to um, work towards getting our assets hardened? And another great question. Um, that really speaks to uh, equities and expertise of my colleague on the, uh, the Joint Force Cyber uh, Component Command. That's uh, certainly within their heel wheel wheelhouse to understand that threat and, and how we might counter that. Um, certainly from our perspective, it is a concern. The space infrastructure that we concern ourselves with consists of activities or platforms of vehicles that are on orbit in space, obviously ground infrastructure that would be a concern, and then the link between the two, that uh, the communication signal between those two, um, all of which are potential avenues for our adversaries to uh, to try and, and affect what it is that we're doing and degrade our capabilities. Uh, any further than that, though, on the cyber front, I would have to defer to my cyber colleagues. Okay. Within the last several months, uh, there was um, a satellite by China that came very close to one of our North American defense satellites. Um, it was eclipsing our, our satellite for a while. Is there any indication that uh, that Chinese satellite obtained any information or changed any of the coordinates or did anything to the North American defense satellite? At this point, I would say that there's no indication that it caused us to change or would cause our allies to change anything that they're doing on orbit. Uh, certainly, we watch that with great interest. And the ability to understand that kind of activity on orbit speaks to the criticality of space domain awareness and how important it is uh, that we, either through our own contributions and also then being plugged into uh, wider allied efforts, are able to understand who's doing what on orbit if a satellite is satellite, for instance, is approaching one of our own, um, and being able to attribute those actions uh, to whoever might be responsible for doing that activity. Okay, so they're also saying that uh, in the United States, uh, the Intelligence Committee, that the uh, nuclear weapons could be launched in space by placing the weapon into orbit. Is that possible right now? Do we know that it's not uh, currently in place? We've not seen that at this point, so I don't believe that that is something we're concerned with. Um, is it theoretically possible? Potentially at some point down the road, but not something that we're dealing with at the moment. Okay. So back to um, the uh, Chinese uh, communist-owned satellites. Uh, what, if anything, do they have to do with these balloons and uh, have you had any more uh, sightings or experiences with any of the these balloons that were such a, a concern a number of months ago? Speaker, I'll defer to my Oregon colleague. Yeah, so as far as a link between uh, the satellites and balloons, we, we at the unclassified level have not seen any link between the two other than the fact that uh, a, a balloon flying over North America could be collecting uh, surveillance data. Um, to talking about uh, balloons, um, we, there are thousands of balloons that fly over North America every year. But the, the, we're concerned about the ones that could be uh, de detrimental to our uh, national security. Absolutely. So when we, uh, when we have an unknown track and we think it might be a balloon, um, we, we first of all have to identify it as such, which is challenging given our domain awareness issues. In other words, our radar coverage does not go out far enough out over our coast and over northern Canada. Once we've identified what it is, we have to determine is it a threat to North America. Uh, we haven't seen a similar type threat since, uh, since February of last year, but we do assess every single balloon. We're going to have to uh, Has your that. equipment improved at all so that you yeah. can detect more? You'll have to work your answer back in on something else. Thanks. Currently, uh, the Americans, uh, they have built a network of hundreds of spy satellites, but through Elon Musk's company. Um, I, I know that I have a lot of questions about that partnership, considering our allyship and, and our extreme uh, intertwined uh, role with the United States. How reliant are we upon uh, a company like SpaceX, for example, um, uh, for our capabilities. 
Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I guess I would probably not characterize any of the SpaceX capabilities as spy satellites. They are really communication satellites uh, that are designed to provide high bandwidth communications to a consumer customer. Um, now I know that in the interests of understanding how that might work in a military context, um, there has been uh, use of, of Starlink capabilities on the U.S. side to, to better understand whether or not that would serve a, a need for, for more communications. I don't think we can ever have too many communications capabilities in a military context. Um, but, uh, you know, as for our reliance on it, in, from a Canadian perspective, we're not reliant at all on anything like SpaceX or Starlink um, for, for conducting any of our business, um, which isn't to say at some point we might not want to use SpaceX or another commercial provider for satellite communications in addition to uh, military satellite communications. Okay, we're going to have that to... Would be, uh, the same as using you know, the, the internet. So. Thank you. General Frawley, in, in response to uh, uh, Mrs. Scallant's question about um, domain awareness, you, well, actually her question about the possibility of further in incursions into Canadian airspace, such as what we saw in the uh, early months of 2023, you said that, uh, that, there are, that our radar coverage is insufficient to detect these kinds of threats, or at least all of these kinds of threats. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. So, um, I mean, this has been identified numerous years. Um, our commander uh, file makes a report to both the Secretary of Defense and the Chief of the Defense Staff highlighting that we have issues with domain awareness when it comes to our radar coverage. So if you look out beyond our coasts, um, both uh, east, west, and, all, and in the north, um, once you get uh, a distance off the coast, we have no radar coverage. Um, in northern Canada, central northern Canada especially, if you look at a map of where everybody lives in northern Canada, where there's very few people, there's very little to no radar coverage, including communication coverage. Um, that, again, has been identified, and that's why we are moving forward with over-the-horizon radar to, to solve that problem, covering those areas that are currently not covered. Okay, so what's the delivery date of uh, an over-the-horizon uh, system that will correct all of these shortcomings? Okay, so I can speak to over-the-horizon, it's, it's OTHR Arctic, which is one of two Canadian radars that will be fielded by 2026. The polar variant, which will be situated further north in Canada, which will look over the poles. Um, I don't have a date on that, but it's a number of years later. There's still a, num a, man, a certain amount of R&D going on to to figure out how to bounce uh, off of the polar atmosphere. And the U.S. are in line with similar timelines, 2026, for their radars for the coasts. Okay, so in, in 2022, the Auditor General reported that, uh, that it will take a decade for the Canadian Space Agency to launch a successor to Radarsat, uh, and that an interruption in satellite Earth observation services past 2026 is a significant risk. Um, when will we have a successor to radar sat? Talk about that. Yeah, thanks very much for the question, Mr. Speaker. So um, we have been leveraging uh, Radarsat 2 for a, a number of years to provide synthetic aperture radar, um, intelligence gathering or information gathering, if you will, uh, overlaid with automated uh, identification of shipping uh, to look at the approaches to North America. Um, Radarsat 2 then begat Radarsat Constellation Mission, which we worked very closely with the Canadian Space Agency um, in order to deliver those effects. Um, and uh, I believe it was just last year, if I'm not mistaken, where the, uh, there was an announcement for the uh, CSA, uh, a funding announcement in order to extend the lifespan of our RCM. And, and I understand my CSA colleagues are following us today, so I'll let them uh, talk about how uh, Radarsat Constellation Mission will be extended going into the future. Beyond that, you know, we do have a program of record, uh, Defense Enhanced Surveillance uh, from Space, uh, which will provide... Um, synthetic aperture radar, as we've seen now with uh, with AIS data, uh, and then potentially other uh, onboard sensors as well to contribute to our understanding of what's going on around the globe. Uh, delivery timelines at the moment, I believe, are probably uh, mid 2030s. If I may go back to to, uh, to General Frawley, if if radar sat fails in in 2026, as, as is the expectation built into the the lifespan of that system, how does that affect uh, North American air defense? Uh, Mr. Chair, so we use Radarsat, Radarsat Constellation mission primarily, primarily for maritime warning, the third mission that I mentioned. Um, it's not the only source of data. Clearly there's uh, RCM 
and there's other data available. So it, it's blended in with significant other ISR data from other platforms to give us our maritime warning picture. Okay, and you're gonna you're gonna defer to uh, uh, our next panel on the on the expectation of replacement on that. You don't know when when the ra when radar sat replacement will be ready. Radar sat constellation yes. mission, the th yes. the three satellites in uh, in. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any information on that, all Mr. Right. Chair. Um, oh, all right. Well, um, <laughs> do we have what of the capacity for? Is there a capacity within the private sector um, to to provide the information that uh, the, or we are waiting? Is there is there anything off the shelf that could be quickly procured uh, for for replacement of this system or to replace the capability of the system? Certainly, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, I fully expect that there would be some kind of um, civil or commercial uh, capability that would be available for us in order to uh, to leverage. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Madame Lambropoulos, five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to both of our witnesses for being here to answer some of our questions today. Um, so I guess based on the conversation that we're having, it seems like we don't know much because it's a domain that we don't have very much research on and, and just in general, we don't we have we rely very heavily on our allies in order to have a united front to protect ourselves. Um, what are some of the challenges, barriers specifically, when it comes to emerging uh, to to an emerging domain such as this? What are specifically the barriers that we have in front of us, and are there any strategies in place to make sure that we get to where we need to be in order to be effective? Uh, great question, uh, Mr. Chair, and certainly I would characterize um, not necessarily barriers, but th things that we're working on, things that we need to make sure that we better understand um, would be space domain awareness would be a classic example of that. Understanding what's going on on orbit, um, understanding what our adversaries, what other companies are up to. Uh, the domain is is getting increasingly congested. There are far more actors in space than there used to be. It's not just nation states that have the ability to do this now, but a significant number of commercial actors that are out there. Um, a lot of activity and certainly understanding what's going on, being able to prevent um, collisions or potential uh, impacts out there. Um, so space domain awareness is probably one of the larger challenges that we're dealing with at the moment. We do this, uh, or we maintain this awareness through a number of fronts. We have um, um, Canada's satellite Sapphire, uh, which contributes to the space surveillance network in the U.S. Uh, for the amount of goodness we put Sapphire in, that contributes to the larger database, and then we get all sorts of great information out in terms of global awareness of what's going on. Um, we're also part of uh, an organization called Joint Commercial Operations, which is almost like crowdfunding space domain awareness. It leverages um, a number of satellite observation stations on the globe, radars, whether they be academia, uh, commercial companies, industry, um, and and, and all of those companies um, subscribe into the central database. They put all of their information in there. It's unclassified. And, uh, and basically, we collate all of that um, as one of the partnering nations and are able to use that information as well to better understand what's going on in the domain as well. Um, it's, it is a challenge. And certainly, I don't think we'll ever say that we have too much ability to uh, understand what's going on in the domain. But certainly, from a Canadian perspective, it's these international efforts and collaboration that allow us to maintain uh, shared awareness. Canada does a lot of trade with um, countries like um, Israel in terms of space domain. Um, we've now put forward a motion to, to really heighten um, our arms trade controls and those arms trade treaties. Can you speak to that and what that means in terms of space and those other players on the, on the world front in like two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Merci, um, a great question. I'm not sure that I can speak to a lot of that. Um, you know, at the moment, um, where we're concentrating our efforts from the space division standpoint uh, is working with our allies, um, you know, closely to understand uh, the sort of near and present uh, threats from a military perspective. Uh, so that would, you know, the obvious um, answers to that would be China and Russia would be the other one. And we haven't talked a lot about Russia. Russia is really a space power in decline. They continue to launch. Um, um, but not nearly at the rate uh, that they would have in the past, uh, and certainly not that a rate that I think they would continue to enjoy. Um, I think that the um, 
sanctions and the activities, uh, the illegal conflict in, in Ukraine are having adverse effects on their abilities to be able to do all of that. Uh, and certainly they're losing commercial customers in terms of launch um, because of their activities in that regard. Uh, so I think, you know, from our perspective, we watch them carefully. Uh, they continue to field significant capabilities to deny us use of the domain, uh, but we don't see them um, using the domain in nearly the same way or nearly as reliant as we have been. I mentioned Israel. You didn't. You didn't respond. Do we share satellite space intelligence with them, um, and are they applicable to that arms trade treaty? How do we navigate that? That I can't speak to. The um, CF Intelligence Command is the organization with the Canadian Armed Forces that does any work in that regard. That's not something that we're, we uh, we work in at all. Thanks, Mr. Bazan. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank both our witnesses for being here. Good seeing you again, General uh, Frawley. It's always great to have uh, NORAD at the table, and General Amundsen, uh, w welcome to committee. Um, just to drill down more on the nuclear weaponization of space, uh, the U.S., I know back in the 60s, did a number of nuclear tests, I think five, under Operation Fishbowl. Um, knowing the impact back then, uh, if the Russians decided to target satellites, how big a blast area are we potentially talking about and how many communication satellites and other satellites that we have in space would be impacted at the various levels? Has anybody done that analysis and especially... Mr. Chair, that's a great question. There are a lot of variables in that, uh, in the answer. It would really depend on the size of the weapon. Um, so that would be obviously something we would be interested to understand if this was in fact um, a reality. Um, where on orbit it would be then detonated is also a concern. Um, you know, low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, you know, geostationary or somewhere in between uh, would certainly affect um, the, the, the blast pattern, the blast radius, if you will. Um, whether or not then those effects would reach across various orbital domains would also be something we'd be interested to try and understand. Um, and then the long-term effects of that, obviously, there would be, um, you know, probably destructive effects with those um, satellite vehicles that would be in the direct line of sight of such a blast. Uh, the follow-on concern then becomes then the radiated space that is now existing afterwards that, again, depending on the orbital domain, other satellites might be going through then over the next period of time, whether that be hours, days, weeks, or what have you. Um, the expectation is that that would have a deleterious effect, whether that would result in um, the destruction of those satellites, a reduced lifespan, um, or, or no effect at all remains to be seen. Uh, certainly when those tests were done in the 60s, there wasn't nearly the on-orbit activity that we have now, uh, so it would be kind of hard to assess that at the moment. Okay, I appreciate that. And But it, uh, I, my understanding is that when one of those tests in particular, that over a third of the satellites that, that were in orbit at that time were impacted uh, because of both the, the after effect plus the immediate blast. Uh, and you look at the exponential growth in satellites that are uh, currently in our space, uh, it would have a, a much greater impact and impact the way we do business. Like we re everybody relies on, on the satellite communication. So speaking about that satellite communication, we talk about NORAD modernization. We talk about the F-35s coming online. Uh, you know, uh, DPU talks about uh, having uh, early warning uh, aircraft and command, uh, AWACS. Um, what do we need in space to uh, enable those platforms to do the NORAD mission, uh, particularly in the Arctic? Yeah, Our Chairman, thanks for the question. So obviously um, anything linked to ISR is critical for us. So anything linked to especially uh, polar over the horizon radar, given where it's going to be, it'll communicate through, com through SATCOM to get its uh, information back to our headquarters. Um, certainly um, co uh, communications SATCOM-wise, as I said earlier, we have huge gaping uh, communication holes over northern Canada and clearly o over the Arctic. If we're going to reach out and touch the uh, Russian bombers before they launch their cruise missiles, which is our goal, then we're going to have to be able to get a long way north, and so we need communications uh, that cover over the entirety of the northern pole. No, and I, I appreciate that because I, no, I've seen the map where, you know, we, we uh, actually have our north warning system and how the entire interior of, of uh, nor northern Canada and the entire Arctic archipelago, with the exception of Alert and maybe Resolute Bay, are, are completely bare naked. Like, there is no surveillance there at all. So the, the over-horizon is, uh, uh, radar or, oh, is important. But also, what about uh, LEOs, low Earth orbit satellites, to help inform our uh, early warning system as well? 
Is, um, is that something that, that NORAD's looking at? Is that just something that's a part of the intelligence gathering that, that Space Command's going to be needing? So what I can say from Mr. Chairman from a NORAD perspective is NORAD doesn't do space. We rely on space. So we describe what our requirements are. And then on the U.S. side, U.S. Spacecom um, and U.S. Space Force will determine what's, what is the best way to deliver that. And on the Canadian side, it would be DG Air, space, uh, force, Air and Space Force Development. So again, we, we very clearly highlight what we need, where our shortcomings are, but we don't actually determine is it best suited to be LEO, uh, GEO, highly uh, elliptical, et cetera, et cetera. Over. I am fascinated, though, with our increasing reliance on industry. There is the politics of industry itself. Uh, I'll raise the Starlink issue with, um, with the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict. That was played out in, in a very public way. Um, and so s some in the public might say that an increasing reliance on the private sector or industry or for-profit organizations, there, there may arise in the future, and I'll, I'll, I'm not asking for your opinion on the Starlink situation, but there may be scenarios like that in the future where there's some question about security and partnerships, whether they're legal or not. Um, how can the public be assured that we're, we're protected with those agreements, knowing that there's an element of politics um, with some of these situations that arise? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's, that's a great question, um, and certainly um, a, an issue and a concern that we have lived with as we've looked at standing up our commercial integration cell, because obviously uh, we want to make sure that there is no appearance of impropriety in dealing with a commercial company um, such that you know their participation uh, in this initiative would provide them some kind of undue advantage on a future project or procurement capability as well. Um, and it's one that we've seen, like I said, our allies uh, come to grips with as well. So you have to have, I think, very clear uh, guardrails in place to make sure that you keep things appropriate. Uh, certainly, I am... Um, much more uh, beholden to policy advice in this position than I've ever been before, and I, I don't do anything without talking to my policy and, and JAG colleagues when we look at this. Um, it's, it's something that I think is we're highly sensitive to and, and something that uh, is certainly um, looked at very closely as we go forward. General Frawley, on that same issue? I mean, on the NORAD side, we don't see near as much uh, uh, of that, that type of contracting, et cetera, et cetera, as, as we do uh, on, in other parts of, of the government and within the Department of National Defense. And most of that would be on the U.S. side as opposed to the Canadian side, which I'm, I'm not uh, at liberty to talk about. So.